is one of the first steps is validating those feelings. Because if we push them away, and this to me is a piece of um, the evolution of our spiritual practice. So if you just try to sublimate those feelings, if you just push them away or you work to sublimate them and go straight, you can, you can pretty quickly come into non-dual consciousness once you know how. Conscious Conversations with Nick and Nitin. All right. Welcome into another powerful Conscious Conversation. I'm your host, Nick Paladino King, with my co-host, as always, Nathan Garg. Hello. And hey, hey. And today we've got the very special privilege of, of interviewing and talking to Samantha Sweetwater. She's the founder of One Life Circle. Samantha, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm great. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, we're super happy for you to be here too. Uh, let me just give a, a quick little background of of who Smith is, and then we'll we'll dive in there and see what this conscious conversation has to bring. Uh, but Smith is a a guy in futurist, a ceremonial guide, and a soul mentor that's been caring caring for people and the earth at the intersection of personal transformation and civilization transition for over thirty years. Um, she's got all types of teachings around spirituality, consciousness, psychedelics. Uh, we're really excited to talk about her, some of her her writing she's been doing, and just kind of the way she sees the world evolving with with consciousness as a whole. So, Samantha, I hope I did you some honor there in introducing yourself, uh, but we're excited to, to dive into who you are and uh, what, what you're teaching. Really beautiful. Um, shall I do a grounding for us? Yeah. And- Please let's let's start there. Get us grounded. Get the audience grounded, and then we'll we'll dive into a, a convo from there. Well, what I'd like to invite us to do is we just introduced where we're we are geographically. I'd like for all three of us and all the listeners to just take a moment and acknowledge where you are physically. That there's a physical place that you're sitting or walking or driving through. You may be moving through that place right now. Um, or jogging through that place, but that that place is a a living place. And I want to ask you to feel to the best of your ability where the sun rises in that place relative to your body. So this is a a locationing, locating practice. And, And feeling into that, even if it's kind of hard to identify, it's foggy where I am now. So if I didn't know where that was, it could be hard to identify. Just give gratitude that the sun rises each day and that the sun has risen over this place. So your body is in a place that the sun has risen over for billions of years in its transformation. And if you locate from that easterly point in a compass, you can locate one quarter turn to your right to the south. Which is if you're in the northern hemisphere, that's the direction of warmth. It's the direction that the sun is angled from all the time relative to where we are on the planet latitudinally. And then one more quarter turn to the west where for billions of years the sun has set relative to the earth spinning and your body is right in the middle of that pattern right now and then another quarter turn to the north which is in this northern hemisphere the direction of cold and stillness and in a a more indigenous way of thinking about being here it's the direction where we let go of the body and go on a journey of disincarnation until you get to the east where you're born again. And then come back around to the east and bring yourself back into the center of yourself and just come into this space with an intention of newness. Like every day the sun rises again. Every day we take a, a new opportunity to engage the cycles of time And as you return back into your center, take a new breath right now. Deep breath in, grounding in center, and exhaling, returning to a circle where we are all located in all of the many places that we, and times that we are. And this is a fun addition as you open your eyes, but I really love this, that 
we are now connected both locally and non-locally and both temporally and non-temporally. This is so cool. <laughs> the thing yeah, I can feel do. I can feel warmth to my left and, and coldness to my right. That was really, mm -hmm. really wild to experience that just really subtleness um, within mm -hmm. my own space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right. so interesting because we live in a time when our, we're not, no longer dependent upon land in an immediate sense or upon the directions or the elements um, in an immediate sense. But reconnecting with that is also to reconnect with the next stage of pattern where we are we're either going to break the biotic, bi the biospheric processes that we're embedded in. And that's a major problem in terms of our flourishing or re-anchor in them. So it's, it's a re-attunement practice, recognizing that where that might be relevant in the present tense is at different orders of scale and in different ways than it would have been in the past. Yeah, and I was noticing my mind going like, is that really west? Is that really east? But I was like, it doesn't matter because what I'm feeling is warmth to my left and cold mm. to my right. And like, just lean into that and go with that and trust that, that my body knows the right directions or the right, you know, the right kind of balance. Yeah. yeah. And, and something about just even recognizing the, the different directions, you know, uh, it's not something we generally do in our day to day. Like, okay, recognizing the relative location of my body to where the sun rises and where the sun sets and then going through the quarter turns and just like really anchoring. And so that was, that was beautiful. Yeah. Just brought a, uh, a real sense of almost like a spatial connection that I haven't experienced mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're welcome. Right. Rad. Well, great. Well, let's let's dive in. Uh, Samantha, we'd love to learn a little bit about you, um, maybe some of your, your past and some of your journey and things that you think will really help us connect to you and who you were, uh, you know, in, in um, relation to who you are now and maybe even to who you will be. Uh, but yeah, we'd learn a little bit, a little bit about you and uh, kind of your journey so far on this on this planet as it's been spinning around the sun. Mm, happy to share. Um I was born in 1972, which was the heart of the Cold War era. And uh, the people who raised me in my first 10 years, my parents were part of a very, uh, an activist, kind of queer activist, Jewish environmentalist community, artist community in Philadelphia. And so I, I, I think who I am is partly Lately, I've been seeing myself as the product of uh, be being raised very early in the school of mutually assured destruction, which is a game theoretic understanding, like from the little kids aid awareness, a game theoretic understanding of multipolar traps, um, which we could unpack if we want to, <laughs> but I had no language for that until much more recently, but I, I had a very in instinctive, intuitive sense of it from a very young age. And also um, one of the adults who was one of my extended family as a kid uh, really came from the Rachel Carson, like the original school of environmental environmentalism as a uh, also linked to an understanding of um, the economic drivers of environmental challenges. And so I think from a very, very young age, I had a deep sense that this could be a lifetime when we could extinct ourselves mm. and, or, or mm. end up in a very dystopic scenario as a species. And I think who I am is uh, deeply initiated by that as in like uh, d developmentally as an early childhood awareness that I think a lot of young people now have a sense for, but, mm -hmm. you know, for the first 35 years of my life, 40 years of my life was quite an unusual thing to be aware of in mm -hmm. my generation. Um, and I think the other thing that is most, was most formative about my experiences, I was sort of raised as a, a child prodigy kid and I was supposed to be a doctor or a lawyer, but what I really wanted to do was dance. And when I was 13, I got myself into a performing arts high school and my sister stopped dancing, which meant I finally had permission in my family dynamics to like do a thing that was her territory. 
Um, and I started locking myself in the dance room in my high school. It was the dance and wrestling room. So it was like sweaty, icky, like mm -hmm. y'all have been in wrestling rooms. <laughs> they stink like boy stink. <laughs> and I would lock myself in that room at lunch times and work with uh, really repetitive music like Philip Glass, very trance, trance based music and work with movement and music and go into transform in, into trance states and and start to ask really deep questions like hmm. why is there war uh what does it mean to come home um what is love uh what is conflict um and i then i started grabbing other kids and inviting them into these processes that were intuitively happening for me and so you know, I'm very much, I would say I'm the product of these two impulses. <laughs> Many years later, I've had multiple, I think of them almost as lifetimes, but you could say multiple careers as a community organizer, a choreographer, a dancer in San Francisco, as a yoga teacher and teacher trainer, um, as the founder of a, a global movement called Dancing Freedom. Uh, that was an embodied mystery school that I trained a couple hundred people in that methodology. Um, and then I was really done dancing and the rest is the history of who I am now. Hmm. Very cool. How did you, how at 13, 14, 15, did you have any idea what these questions even were? Were they coming from somewhere else? Like, were they conscious? You know, I think I really think we're born with these questions and that they get schooled out of us. You know, it's mm -hmm. like Buckminster Fuller said, children are born a genius and the world de geniuses them. And I and there's incredible research that has been done by NASA that indicate like that is tracked how most children when they're very young actually are genius status and that mm. over time as they're in western education they become normal mm -hmm. um and i think i think my early childhood experience uh coupled with like i was raised my parents were they were hippies who became yuppies um but i was i like the the literature and things that i was exposed to as a little kid there was a book called really rosy and it was it had a whole music and things that went with it and it was like i'm really rosy i'm really rosy i'm rosy real you better believe me i'm a great big deal and it was like this super empowering um very very much oriented around self-authentication that i was raised with that was like trust yourself feel mm -hmm. yourself um and so I think partly why those questions came out of me is that I think development developmentally, we are all meant to have those questions, you know, but most, most children don't grow up in a context that continues to nurture that ability. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, I mean, I could say I channeled them or who knows, mm -hmm. who knows, but I was, um, I also was a kind of weird kid. Like my eyes were like hyper dilated and everyone would tease me that I was on pot, even though like I, said, but, like, I was a really curious, like literally wide eyed kid yeah. um, that I had tons of questions. And I think because I, I had more adults around me than just my parents, I was encouraged more than also more than a lot of kids are to keep asking those questions and, trust that I could get answers from them rather than be told that I was too much. And I was definitely told I was too mm. much a lot, <laughs> but I probably got more nurturance for that, like really voracious part of myself than a lot of kids do. I love that. I'm, I'm thinking of, um, you know, in yoga terms, there's the word vichara, which refers to self inquiry. And I didn't hear questions like that until I was in my thirties of, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What do I want? Um, you know, why don't I have it? And I remember the first time my teacher said, who are you? It was like, what do you mean? Who am I? I'm, I'm Nick. And then it was like, my personality went through this whole thing of like, well, I don't know. Am I something more? 
that I've never thought about that. And you go down this whole rabbit hole of, of self inquiry and understanding. And it's in, I love it. Just like the better questions we ask ourselves, the better lives we can live in lives we can live into because you start to go, Oh, I never thought of that. And it just sounds like you got that hit at a young age and um, were nurtured to be abnormal and to be yeah. yourself, uh, which is, I feel like a lot of us are undoing is the sense of as we're waking up consciously, it gets harder and harder to fit in. Um, I'm sure both of you have your own experiences with that, but I really appreciate that you're, that you went there so young. Yeah. I mean, to be clear, I was definitely a freak and an outsider and felt really lonely. Uh, we had moved from the East coast to the West coast when I was 10. I think a lot of those questions were coming from a really deep existential sense of being an outsider, an East coast geek mm -hmm. in a West coast culture where it already really mattered that you were cool and I wasn't cool. Um, and I, my vocabulary was way too big and I actually liked that, you know, like you weren't supposed to like that. And, um, so yeah, and it wasn't till I got myself into a college course my senior year in high school. And then it was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's words for all these things. Whoa. <laughs> like the first time I heard about the Zen concept of the void, I was like, oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. I, uh, I think. Uh... I mean, I think you definitely have a very gifted ability to put things, concepts, feelings into words. Um, you know, I've, I've been reading a whole bunch of uh, stuff you've put out on social media or even, you know, the, the short book that you've created, Life Code. And as I've read through it, it's like, wow, like, okay, these are all the things that I have felt or... Uh, connected with at one point or another. And here I'm reading it put into words in a way that makes sense and I can digest and really connect with. So that was, you certainly have a great gift for that. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Um, and I also want to point out something I feel essential that you're pointing to, which is, you know, for, for both ourselves and also the audience that's listening is like, what might be some of those questions that, or things that we have been curious about that have come up for us during our childhood or have stuck with us through our lifetimes till now that, you know, maybe we have entertained them. Maybe we have gotten curious about them, or maybe we've put them to the side because they were too audacious, too large, and they scare us. Mm -hmm. It could be anything in between. And I'm thinking of an example for myself these days, you know, that's that once I actually sat with that question, a similar question of, geez, when did I really start to ask these questions around who am I, what am I, why am I here? I remember back to this moment in third grade, literally being taught about the solar system from our teacher at the time uh, in, in India and in, in, in a school there, in a small school there, in a very small classroom, right? And uh, I'm, I'm what, probably I'm in third grade age wise, I'm probably 10, 11, 10. And I remember learning about the solar system and just going, wait, what? <laughs> like you're telling us we're sitting on a ball of mud spinning in air in infinite space with all these other planets and the sun. And what the hell are we doing here, by the way? <laughs> and just having that reaction for like, I remember for over a week, I couldn't get put my mind back together. Like I would go to my parents and just be like, wait, is this where we really are? Is teacher just joking or making stuff up? Or is this where we really are? And when they confirmed it, I'm like, holy cow, you guys knew about all of this? <laughs> <laughs> and... So now I remember that moment and go, just, gee, oh, that's where my wonder was really born. Like, that's where I, I still sit with that. Now, every time I look at the night sky, I have, I relive that same moment in third grade and go, geez, I'm still here. <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> so anyways, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> I love that. I think, I mean, you know, it's interesting. The science of awe, Dacher Keltner just um, 
it's a big science, but Decker Keltner has written a book on the science of awe. And that story is so wonderful because the, the, the epiphanic like energy of your awe was so big that it like caused an, one of the qualities of awe is that it causes a need for accommodation. Like it, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a fluid state that can cause shift in worldview, which is like a Holy grail, right. In terms mm-hmm. of transformation in a way. So the, the, the way that that, and landed in you and caused this need for accommodation that like awakened this kind of a wonder and epistemic humility and curiosity. And it's just absolutely a beautiful story. Thank you. I'm, I'm still Mm -hmm. coming to terms with it. (laughs) 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 And, and part of the way has been diving into, you know, uh, 10, 12 years ago, asking these questions around, yeah, what is truth? What is reality? You know, initially it was philosophy. Then it became study of religion. Then it became diving into yoga and the spiritual path to gain a sense of, uh, yeah, what is, what is truth? What is all this? Why, why are we here? What's, what's this journey all about that we're on? Um, yeah, and I'm I'm actually curious to hear your thoughts. Like, uh, what comes up for you as I say all this? Oh my! Well, back to the solar system. Like, I I I <clears throat> I'm a little obsessed right now by a renewed inquiry. This is not a new inquiry for me, but a renewed inquiry into the solar system and the galaxy as a greater temporal map you could say of the evolution of consciousness um and that relates to the inquiry of like why are we here what is truth and it's interesting to think about the evolution of living systems the evolution of consciousness the evolution of humanity are we becoming an enlightened species what is our role why are we here I think about what we are and who we are. So you read, you read Life Code, which is the preview to True Human, which is the book I'm putting out early next year. I think of why we're here, both in the trans, in the transcendent and in the imminent in two different ways. So you could say in the transcendent, why we're here is to become fully awakened to in a sense know that we aren't any of the things that we are consciousness and that we 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 are in the world but not of it is how the yogic traditions often Mm -hmm. articulate articulate why we're here but then in the imminent domain And this, to me, is the next stitch on our collective narrative about spirituality and consciousness, is that in the imminent domain, what we are is human organisms who are embedded within the Gaian and biospheric systems, ecologically, who actually have the ability to play an exquisite and unique role as co-orchestrators and custodians of the Gaian of Gaian evolution. I call it of life's song Hmm. of the Gaian symphony. So in that sense, we're collaborators, co-creators in an indigenous frame. It's often explained as a, we're a custodian species who has a biological, ecological function in the biosphere and in the evolution of Gaia. Um, and in some frames, like if you reach to Teilhard de Chardin's frame, our role is to boot up a neosphere, the neosphere being an ideational and technological process that is consciously <clears throat> nurturing us as organ- human organisms who on one level are consciousness and on another level, we are bodies mm-hmm. that who, one of the horizons we're on right now collectively is realizing that if we dysregulate the environment, we dysregulate ourselves 
we end up with mm -hmm. massive physical and mental health crisis. So we're, we're come, our own organisms are pointing to the fact that we are not just consciousness. We are organisms who are biological beings who are interdependent, dependently co-arising with, in the Buddha's words, the Gaian, Gaian processes, embodied processes. We are bodies nested inside, in relating to other bodies and nested inside a larger body. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, what we are, are organisms who are, who can break planets, who need to create cultural mechanisms to manage our own creative co competencies and align ourselves effectively, both uh, on our own terms as organisms, as human beings, but also technologically with the well-being of nature. Mm -hmm. and and we're actually starting to like hit those we're hitting planetary boundaries i call that the planetary crucible and the planet the, the crucible which is also technological so we're hitting there's ecological bounds that we're hitting and then we're also hitting technological bounds where we get to decide do we want to live a transhumanist kind of like there's various techno optimist narratives that say like the we're just evolving we're just here to boot up silicon. I don't, I don't see any truth to that. Actually, I think we're here to what when spiritually at the, in all the different ways that I've listened most deeply, the message I receive again and again is that we are here to evolve into the next level of maturity of technological maturity and spiritual maturity and soul level maturity to co-create a culture that aligns technology with our own well with with nature's well-being and our own well-being mm. and the evolutionary process of the planet that was a really intense answer to a not yeah. as complex question no, that's a that's a really <laughs> great answer and i'm struggling with i'm struggling with some aspects of it in the sense of like i totally agree with you that we are this we are these conscious beings that are here having a spiritual experience and we're also these organisms that live in matter and what we do affects the planet and vice versa. Um, and I want us to be custodians. I want us to be, you know, the responsible for the elevation of all creation, not just people. But what I'm having the sticking point with is like, I don't, I don't believe the human is showing up as a, as a custodian of the planet currently. I think we're showing up as the, yeah as the inverse in as a majority and there's and as each of us wake up yes um but that to me is what hurts or feels out of alignment is that we're not acting as a custodian we're acting more as a, a destroyer rather than a curator yeah. what's what's your as an extractor. what's your guys take on the yeah. yeah what's your guys take on that and then how do we how do we change that um destroyer extractor mm -hmm. colonizer cancer yeah. Necrosis has come up recently in terms Paras of the, parasite. Yeah. Like if you look at how quickly necrosis can actually take over a body, you could compare the AI build to that actual process inside a body. It's a pretty scary uh, comparison that has a lot of truth to it in terms of energy use and water use and all the things that go into um, mm -hmm. ever rapid, more rapid development. Um, well, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and why I, 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 I think, I think that I love, so you spoke to when you, when you feel that there's a kind of, there's a, a, an index of emotions that come up, hopelessness, anger, mm -hmm. fear, sadness, grief. And I think one of the first steps is, and I, I do this a lot in my public facing work, is one of the first steps is validating those feelings. Because if we push them away, and this to me is a piece of um, the evolution of our spiritual practice. So if you just try to sublimate those feelings, if you just push them away or you work to sublimate them and go straight, you can, you can pretty quickly come into non-dual consciousness mm -hmm. once you know how and then those feelings are just waves of awareness 
but that there's a an initiatory process that is about um, welcoming and metabolizing those feelings that is actually part of coming back to ground and saying, oh, would I rather be a human co-evolving the cultural narrative at this time, which is to own your own power and your own analysis? Because it's like everything we're saying right now, you're like, wow, that really makes sense. Yes, mm -hmm. it does, right? Like there's a there's an alchemy to saying, oh, this is what, what you are. What you are is an organism inside a guy, an organism who is individually alive at a time when we are collectively tasked with transforming the operation of civilization as we know it. Because all the people who are building towards in the cancerous direction, to some degree, it's no way their fault. They're mm -hmm. just functioning according to the metrics of civilization as we know it. Mm -hmm. So, so the, uh, the grief, if, if you, if you allow yourself to integrate it into your sense making your deepest sense making process about who and what you are, and, you know, then in Douglas Rushkoff's words, it's our job to find the others and start cobbling together, you know, emergent systems and emergent stories and stopping actions that's a trinity from joanna macy mm -hmm. that the the very very simple operation of this emergence lives in this uh cycling you could say of new and ancient systems new and ancient stories and and that which we can't do anymore what we need to restrain ourselves from doing as we work to boot up new patterns mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a validation that is sacred. That's very humbling, right? Because then you're mm -hmm. not just humming in the, I'm just consciousness. You're actually regrounded in yes. And I am organism who is here to, in a very non-arbitrary way, you know, to con create continuity for your children. Mm -hmm. In fact, that seems and to be one of the things that, tends to bring this home for a lot of people, you know, even in the mm -hmm. corporate world where they're like, yeah, yeah. What about my children? What about my grandparents? Cause I see the trajectory we're on, you know, there's an increased realist recognition of the patterns, the, the devastating climate events that continue to exacerbate and increase year over year. And that seems to be one of the things that really brings people home is like, yes. Yeah. When I think about my children, when I think about my grandchildren, yeah, I see the road we're headed down and we've got to change. Yeah. Yeah. They've got to connect it's, to something I mean, greater than themselves. Totally. Totally. And it's, it's, it's one of those places where you, when you choose to engage people in the conversation, you'll hit the, like the spot they're not going to go further than usually it's around economic self-interest. Mm. And, and so you know, I think we get to keep nurturing that while while saying like, wait, there's 8 billion of us. Like the, the possibility of the transformation has 8 billion minds connected mm -hmm. to it. How could we possibly know, you know, how those adaptive functions might wake up in us if we start to validate them? So I think my work in a sense at the core of what I'm doing is I'm here to validate this, what I think of as an adaptive response where we start to recognize that we as a collective need to function in, harmon or in harmony with Gaia, with the biosphere. You know, and in terms of social evolution, this is, this is a really fun idea, but um, there's, there's a huge debate about how we evolved socially to be who we are as these very complex social organisms with many different functions. But I tend to orient towards multi-level selection, which speaks to how we evolved at the, with the twin forces of individual, individuation and uh, altruistic cooperation within tribal groups. So you could say all the reasons why we're stuck right now are very obviously the result of these two evolutionary impulses. In other words, 
all the things that aren't working are either not working because we've got individuals out for their own self-interest or we've got tribes against tribes. Mm -hmm. And, and we're kind of stuck at that stage. So if we make it to the next stage, there's some jump of we're all one species and we need to collectively identify as custodians of this planet which is a jump of social evolution. I call that third tier social evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but I do put this narrative out in my book that, that if we make it, it's because there's a, a jump of identification with us as a single species that is collectively tasked with a custodian duty and opportunity that is like exquisitely purposeful in ways that the zero sum game is not um that yeah that's our opportunity there's what's what's coming up for me is a sense of like we need to stop chasing comfort i don't know why that's coming coming through it's like all of the the damage we're doing to the planet really comes down to our own self-preservation and our own comforts like i want the ac to be perfect. I want to have an, I want gas to be cheap so I can drive. You know, I want to be able to fly to wherever I want, whenever I want. It's like all of these things that we have access to are, are great. And it's a, our constant obsession with comfort that's really creating so much damage. So to me, it almost sounds like we need to connect to something deeper, something larger than ourselves and say, wow, it's okay if I don't have everything I need and everything I want, because there's a bigger game here that's being played. And I think you're right. That's ownership. That's responsibility. That's empowerment to say, no, I don't need to destroy the planet in order for me to have what I want. Cause actually from what you're saying, Smith is by destroying the, the planet, I'm actually destroying myself. And I don't know if that is a strong enough narrative in our, in our cultures, like the impacts we're having on the planet impact us. It's like, I am that, that I am that there's that disconnect. And, and that I am is also outside of me. And it's, I think if we get to that space, that's how we make this jump of we are all one organism. We all are one, you know, community. And that's that's not what the powers that be seem to want us to to go for at all. And we've all touched that. We all can feel that as an embodied state. Um, how do we make how do we make that jump? Because what I think what we're talking about, a lot of people can can understand intellectually, but how do we then shift that into an embodied way of being. And I think that's a lot of where your work is, but how do we shift from that? I like, understand what, what we're all saying to this is embodied and I'm living it. I mean, I, I think I would answer that with a question as opposed mm -hmm. to a strategy. Um, and the question is something like, there's probably an ecology of questions actually to explore an ecology of strategies. Um, because certainly the answer to that question would be very different in different contexts mm -hmm. um, or the answers to the, the questions will be very different in different contexts. But I think a question would be to start with would be how can I create more relationships, create more community that are, that is both non-local and local that is oriented towards um, the well-being of the community, of the ecologies that I interact with, of the, yeah, of the community and of the ecologies I interact with. And this is interesting because we live in such a global culture and we've become really oriented to non-local community. I think it's really important to ask that those questions always, both locally and relative to your your other networks. But there's, I think part of the way forward has to do with tending community and network and place and continuing to ask those questions. So like an example in my case is I'm involved in a number of projects. One example, I'll give you two. One is we're still trying to figure out the date for the block party for my neighborhood where we can all meet each other and deepen our phone tree and deepen collective resilience by having drinks and dinner together and bringing all the kids. That's an example locally where whatever horizons we're on, if someone dies, if someone gets hurt, 
if the shit hits the fan. <laughs> like it's better. It's good to have a local network that's resilient. A, on a different level, there's a place I visit very often and uh, deciding which parcel I'm going to buy in the Diamante Valley in Costa Rica. I'm part of two projects there, both of which um, as white Western stakeholders, we're working really deeply with local Ticos and local indigenous and the watershed and doing multiple projects to deepen resilience, um, improve the watershed, protect the remaining forest there. Um, so that those projects you would say are, are, are not neo, we're not being neo-colonialists. We're doing mm -hmm. the other thing and building relationships and building neighborliness and deepening bioregional resilience for that valley and that particular area of Costa Rica, which is fairly unusual uh, in terms of what's going on predominantly with folks doing development in Costa Rica. So I think, I think we have to like look at uh, how we're thinking about how we're doing anything and say, is this building strength in relationships and potentially building resilience in place and watershed and um, biodiversity? Um, another example would be choosing to shift from buying food from Whole Foods to like spend the money on a CSA. Like there's little ways you can answer those questions when you start to look at them of like, oh, I'm going to spend my, I'm going to spend money on local farmers who are also doing watershed repair mm -hmm. in my area. Like, because what we're talking about is a shift that is the entire ecology of players and civilization. But there's some foundational things like we need to have better relationships and we also need to reroute in stewardship of place. Those are those are not arbitrary. Those are, those are actual principles of an emergence that is bio flourishing. So another example would be in some audacious version of um, national government where we mimic um, Bhutan and we start planting five trees for every child who's born in the United States. Mm. Or putting money into expanding wildlands and national parks for every child who's born in the United States. Right. So, so you, you have to kind of think constantly, how could, how could I shift what's happening to be more in stewardship collaboration, both with humans and with the more than human world. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. nice, and then how nice that answer. looks in different places. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. How it looks in different places is going to be so different because like in most Latin American cultures, cooperatives are very, very normal because people have known for a long time that there's more resilience in letting go of some of your self, you know, individual comfort in favor of if anybody gets hurt, we all help everybody. We all help. If anyone needs help, we all help. Um, similarly, in, in a lot of African cultures, there's a very deep, you know, in, in the Zulu concept of Ubuntu, I am because we are, and it's like so normal where even if you have like one nut, you're going to share it with everyone who you're sitting with. Um, what I, what my friend Renee says, who's, uh, he's one of the wildland ecologists working on the Klamath Dam project so they've taken down the dams on the Klamath River and the salmon are starting to come back it's this incredible project on the Klamath River uh, in California and Oregon and he said what he's seen is that reciprocity is so natural to us mm -hmm. so when when given an opportunity to engage with greater collaborative towards greater well-being um, people really naturally start to come into the, they're like how can I help what do I what can I do like mm -hmm. can I feed everybody you know that there's this this thing that lights up in our biology that's really really healthy that we've not had the opportunity to do mm -hmm. and he said it's contagious we're hard we're hardwired to help everyone around us survive and maybe what you're saying is we need to, to retouch that of like actually if I help you survive that helps me survive so there's this like selfishness in our hardwiring 
that actually maybe is our superpower to to make these jumps. And I just really appreciate that you went from micro of where you're sourcing your food from to community to how you're bringing together to global. And I think that's a really practical way that we can all make small changes, micro changes, and then eventually have a macro impact because um, it's not going to be one lever that we pull. It's not one action that's going to change change the world. It's going to be a that's collective right. effort to for all of us to do our part in whatever way, whatever way that yeah. is. Yeah, and like a you know a collective journey as well, which is also a very individual journey for mm -hmm. each person. Like as as you were talking, Samantha, you know, I was thinking about yeah, like how would I how would I boil this down to something that like could could become like a guiding question or a way of approach? And one question that was coming up for me was, uh, what brings us true happiness? satisfaction, joy in our lives and start to differentiate between the things that may be transient happiness versus those that truly build long lasting fulfillment in our lives. So then thereby investing in relationships in the community, in your neighborhood becomes a higher importance or, and, you know, actions along, along that path versus one of the things I see and like the, just the positive effect of I have seen of, of it on my own life is as with kids getting busy and as our time for watching TV has gone down and exposure to advertisement has gone down hmm. exponentially in my life over the last 10 years, just due to habits and, and, you know, have having a paid subscription to YouTube, for example, so I don't see ads, uh, has dramatically changed how I look at buying anything it's very like is there a core need for something in my life then i'll look out versus i noticed i mean just the other day a couple months ago we went to the movies with the kids and all you get for 20 minutes is just a barrage of ads that are poking at you right at some feeling or some some uh drive in you to like make you want to go buy or do something that wasn't necessarily coming from within. And it's that, it's that capitalistic machine that's trying to continue to twirl and swirl and pull us into a direction of, yeah, let's keep spending, you know, and, and, and filling our bodies with all kinds of, frankly, junk, you know, yeah. that doesn't serve us or yeah. the planet. And our minds. Right. Yeah. Um, you know what I heard? What I hear too, and what you just said is that sometimes I think of this as dopamine sovereignty, like mm -hmm. circumstance created a context where like, and then you started consciously collaborating, with like get all these hooks out of my space <laughs> yeah. and that, that, that there's a, there's a biochemical dimension of that, of re-regulating with a different hormonal index where there's, it's more serotogenic and balanced in oxytocin. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I have my, my dopamine sovereignty. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> I like yeah. that. That's good. And what's, what's coming up for me, interestingly enough, as I don't think about these often, but I know we all have a yogic background is, is the yamas, um, which are codes yes. we can live by. And it's, you know, ahimsa, nonviolence, satya, truthfulness, um, a sense of non-stealing, a sense of abstinence, and then a non-accumulation or non-grasping. And I don't know, as, as we're all talking, the yamas are really speaking to me of like as a really good framework mm -hmm. for, oh, where do I start? Well, start with those. Start with the yamas and the niyamas. Start with some external practices and some internal practices. Yeah. And eventually, I don't know if anyone else has had this, then I find at some point I don't need those because it's like, well, why would I do anything else but help you if if you and i are the same but the the yamas and the niyamas from yoga are really really great foundation for understanding how to be with yourself and how to be in the world in a way that's co-existing and um regenerative rather than de degenerative and i think we're all we're all kind of touching on those in our own our own ways yeah i i also love the you know how this conversation uh seems to be pointing us towards something, Samantha, you talk a lot about is this notion of a true human and connection to nature um, that you've written a lot about. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, I want to invite you to invite you to introduce that to the audience and talk a little bit about that. 
because I, I feel sure. it's just a beautiful way of looking at what we're, what we're really talking about here. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So, so the book that I'm writing is called True Human. And the place that that phrase comes from is from a woman who came to me in my dreams as a teacher from another planet. And on the planet that she comes from, uh, they transcended technological adolescence without breaking life. Um, and as I've gotten to know, as I've been in the thought experiment, I, I won't say I channeled her or I didn't channel her. I don't know, you know, but I definitely dreamt her. And then I consider um, her world to be part, something I partner with all the time as a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. um, so in their world, they didn't actually get quite to the level of decimation that we've gotten to because they had stronger cultural management of their uh, imagination and creativity in alignment with life all the way along. Um, they never got so out of, they didn't have as big a cycle of separation as we've had. Mm -hmm. um, but what she said to me at the end of this dream that was during COVID, it was in 2020, she said, the civilizing impulse of true humans is to harmonize the forces of nature. So what I mean when I say true human is oriented in the imminent, in the relational, ecological, biological, biospheric context within which we are these, what I call creator, preserver, destroyer organisms, where these like hyper creative, hyper mental creatures who can actually separate ourselves and distance ourselves from the perceived embeddedness in life, in our environment in our relationships with the biotic environment and um, also have the glamour that we are had sticks on brains on a stick or they, that I think therefore I am is, is the whole truth. Like we can have that glamour, we can manufacture that and like build our identities on the basis of that insight. Even though in reality, like we are continuing, we were born out of wombs that lived in a biological continuum of bodies without which there would not be brains to have the thought, I think, therefore I am. Hmm. Without which there would not be a linguistic development based on all previous linguistic development to have the thought, I think, therefore I am. So, um, but we can, we can build a whole culture on the basis of that insight. We can build centuries of development on that insight. So, um, a true human is a, is a human who understands that the, the imminent domain is actually primary, that the, the fabric of interbeing that makes us possible and the construction of everything that, may, that led up to this exact moment, which in this, in this exact now is timeless. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you could say holds all time on the quantum level, mm -hmm. but on the, biophysical level is a construction that lives in time and there's a sidebar there to construction theory and the new science of construction theory which is exquisite that actually provides a mathematical proof for time um so true humans are humans who've like pragmatically just grounded into the non-arbitrary truth that we're part of the biosphere and that we are kind of like uniquely able to either break or tend life. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think of a true human as a neo-indigenous person. So there are still, bless them, thank you, so many indigenous people still here working to help uh, all the people who forgot our indigeneity to remember through their different lineages and practices. But there's also a biological, bio-spiritual remembrance that is in all of us to have that, oh, wow, I belong to life. I belong to this earth. I'm a body inside in relationship to other bodies inside a bigger body and like interacting with that and co-creating beauty with that is the most meaningful thing we could possibly mm. do. And so that's what a true human is. Um, so a true human is someone who has remembered and is singing their part in life's song. I'm really feeling that in my system as you're yeah. as you're walking you. through that and just it's so beautiful and it's so accessible like you're not talking about something that is outside of us it's actually innate 
And it's, it, I find it can be hard living in San Francisco. It's like I'm surrounded by concrete. It's hard to remember that there's animals and plants and nature. And it's like, all I got to go to do go is to, to your house in Mill Valley in the Redwoods and really quickly go, whoa, there's nature. And I spent a, a week or two in the jungle in Peru recently, and I've never felt so alive. I've never felt so healthy. I've never felt so connected in my life. And I was telling Nathan, like, I thought I was healthy. I thought I knew what connection was, but now I actually know there's such a big gap between what's possible and what I'm experiencing. And But to touch that is like enlightening to almost, uh, to bring it back, it was awe inspiring of, wait, there's this much more I have access to. Um, and it's not that hard. It's actually very simple. It takes effort. It takes some effort and some consciousness to go, okay, let me get outside. Let me connect. And I think it's just this moment of, well, if we connect, if we connect with ourselves, and we we realize there's a bigger bigger play then we can touch these things pretty simply mm -hmm. yeah and we can start to envision the solar punk like amazing biodiverse biophilic future mm -hmm. where you know the fifth sacred thing star starhawk's first there's a series of two books but the fifth sacred thing is such a wonderful book that envisions a green san francisco where mm -hmm. like half the streets are daylighted creeks and like there's tons of wildlife in san francisco and you know there's emergent technology where we can put graphite in concrete and concrete becomes carbon sequestering mm -hmm. and then we do like my futurist brain right now as you're speaking is seeing like oh well you don't need to move to the jungle we just need to green san francisco <laughs> and then yeah, like envisioning that. like yeah. that little seven mile spot of land with like tons of green wildlife corridors and it, buildings with birds living off the trees yeah. that live off the burl buildings and it actually reminds me of this picture of san francisco where i think it's market street and it's not as paved like there's these buggies going down san francisco and you see dirt and you know mud in places and a recent thing a recent realization that I've just been with is like, wow, like for me to really touch uh, gra the real ground or to be on real ground, I have to either find a patch in my garden, which thankfully I have a garden, uh, or I would have to get off all streets and go into the hills. And thankfully the hills aren't paved. They're protected natural spaces that I can actually go into and, and experience that. But I was like, wow, it is really difficult to find mm -hmm. a patch of ground that, that we haven't paved over. Uh, so I, I love what you're saying there because I think there is some aspect of we've gone a little too far in our, in our escapade to you know, remove all dirt and you know, whatever the concerns were mm -hmm. with water flowing into the bay or, or et cetera. Uh, and really like find that balance. You know, we were on one extreme, maybe, yeah, things were too raw. And now we're on the other extreme where it's like, we've literally just blanketed nature out of our cities, leaving little holes for a tree or a plant to grow. And that's, that's really it. You know, we're spending time repairing concrete being moved by trees rather than celebrating the roots of the trees that are growing there. Right. Right. Yeah. It can all be different and, and one step at a time. It's interesting to bring in like I, I sometimes think of like like the, the, the most audacious, most beautiful possible vision we could have we could have of bio of geoengineering at scale uh, is very watershed specific and you know, invites a deepening of a, a restoration of wildlife corridors and riparian corridors and um, collaborating with new building technologies and green buildings, collaborating with daylighting creeks, collaborating with working in, you know, in, in the Bay Area, working in the hills to key line plow the hills so that we actually reactivate the hydrophilic nature of the, the watersheds of the the aquifers i mean there's we've done so much damage we pulled all the water out of landscapes we've um both 
agriculturally, like a lot of the land that isn't paved is still heavily, most of it is heavily damaged because of how we worked with land use and water and grazing and all the things. But there's ways to do all those things in ways that are regenerative and repairing, reparative. Um, so I'm reading this wonderful book right now. It's called A Half-Built Garden. Um, it's set in 2083. And I won't give you all the details, but one of the one of the things that the, the the primary governance group is watershed groups, and they've just made immense progress in restoration and repair. And one of the things that's really lovely about this narrative is it's fairly realistic about the level of climate disruption that this group of people who's in 2083 has already lived through mm. as they're starting to reactivate the virtuous cycles of hydrological integrity and watershed integrity and biodiversity, but predominantly we've disrupted the entire hydrological cycle of our planet. So like, that's what all these mega storms and mega droughts are about. And this book is really interesting because it has a fairly realistic take on what people in 2083 who are doing the right thing would have already gone through to get to 2083. Mm -hmm. A great, it's a great sci-fi book. It's by Ruth Ann Emrys. I won't, I'm there's all kinds of, of other fun pieces. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm thinking as you're talking, we had one of our original guests, his name was Billy Mandarino. I don't know if you've ever met him. He's a very cool guy. And he talks about thinking from the end. And to me, that yeah. kind of sounds what you're talking about. It's like, hey, you have this really great, grandiose vision of where we could go, but we need to include that into what we can do now. Um, and those two can live together. They don't, they're not separate. They're actually connected, but we've got to think about where we want to go and then start to take the small actions. Now. I, I just love the, the practicality of what I'm getting from your, your huge vision and taking it down into our daily actions. Totally. And, and like, it's like an and, and because from mm -hmm. that future casting, you can both think back to like the little steps and you can also find the inspiration for audacious steps. Mm. Like it's like this and, and, because mm -hmm. if you don't have a like, oh, oh the, the audacious vision I'd like to hold is in 300 years, we've like actually navigated a full cycle of carbon resequestration. And we're like starting maybe to like reactivate old growth forests and a little bit of glacial, glacial growth. <laughs> like that's a great set point. I mean, and then we could get into the built environment and the culture and all the other things. What I love about this particular book is it's still squarely in the middle of the disruption cycle that we've already started in a fairly realistic way. And so, yeah. And, and then you keep going back and you're like, yes, there's small steps. And at some point there might be some audacious steps and, and having a bit of that future vision is like, um, as a time warrior, a, a, a beautiful vision that you're not overly attached to, but that has a uh, reality for you, that has aliveness for you, draws you towards it. Mm -hmm. It's like a magnet. Yeah. Samantha, I have a question mm -hmm. that's that was coming cool. up. Uh, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, part of me is wondering, like, it, you know, it feels like this, the, the change that we need and and the the harm that we're causing to the environment uh but the change that we need is happening on in such as feels like a such a slow biological rhythm even though more and more people are waking up to it but it's still very very tiny i mean it's the you know it's the evidence in our last debate it was like the last question in the last minute and no substance to that you know very real recognition of what we're what have we been talking about for like you know almost an hour plus and part of me wonders if there's like uh if in your work in your sensing in uh things you've learned is there a way we should be thinking about kind of like the snake eating its tail you know is there is there like the way you turn capitalism the way it's architected today and are there tweaks you make 
to which this system, who, which is highly effective in moving capital and resources, right, with a stated objective, once people go, I mean, it's just like we've moved mountains, we've transformed countries overnight. I mean, it's crazy how fast things happen in capitalism. Mm -hmm. And part of me wonders if there's a way to harness the energy of that, of that sphere of action into what we're talking about. Um, and I know lots of folks in sustainability are grappling with this problem, but I'm just curious if you, if there's anything that you'd add to that. Mm. With humility, I'd, I would say, I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, and I think that things are getting bad enough that there's potential for some very fast top-down shift. And I think if, I, I don't see Elon Musk being one of the players driving that shift, but I, um, I think there's potential from a very top-down level of a kind of like billionaire process where some very high leverage leaders are just like, no, you're like, that's mm -hmm. crazy talk. Like, we know where we need to go if we want any kind of profitability in the future. You right. know, so Elon Musk was just on Lex Friedman advocated for like, sure, we could do 20 billion people. We cannot do 20 billion people. We actually need to have a peaceful downstepping of population if we want a flourishing future that's beautiful. I think Overton windows can be shifted by facts. And I've been saying lately, uh, right story is power. Um, I really, really, really recommend to both of you and like all the listeners to start listening to the great simplification to Nate Hagen's, he, who he's interviewing. It's like a political fact, like very, very helpful, very deep research and science about what's, what's what for real going on now that is not being um, paid for by businesses or by people's business uh, preferences. Um, and I, I do think there's a potential within the next two years for like a very top down, like, hey, that's all crazy talk. Like, this is what we're going to focus on, because if we don't like there's just no possible future that works for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, there's ways in which uh, the closeness to World War Three and nuclear war is a driver for that, potentially. Um, there's, you know, it's interesting to kind of I think, I think I will just say not, none of the three of us have any power over this, but I think having a conversation about it is a kind of um, imprinting in the subtle field of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there is some power in having the conversation. And, you know, I think how that energy, the energy of um, complicated design, which is like step-by-step -step capitalist style design as opposed to complex design, could bootstrap complex design if there's enough, like, I think there is a potential for some very high leverage stakeholders to get on board with that. Um, of the Charles Schwab's and I don't know if Bill Gates could turn around that hard, <laughs> but I certainly Warren Buffett is turning around that hard. Mm. And, and there's there's other people with that level of resource and influence who are yeah. pushing towards the like system flip. Um, and I think I think that seeing that potential, listening for that potential um, within the spaces we occupy, saying you know we really need to choose who we pay attention to, and we need to call out bullshit when bullshit is bullshit. Like we need to actually have some ethical cojones mm -hmm. because, because there's a lot of very high influence people talking like right. limitless crap that has no respect for the limits that we are reaching. And, and we have to make limits cool. Like mm. constraints are cool. I think that that actually as a, within a spiritual context and a cultural context that we're all part of, like shifting from it's all about limitlessness to it's about liberating your authentic expression. There's a limitless, an unlimitedness to that 
in relationship to constraints and working with constraints effectively is really sexy. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to be effective anyway. So we have to like bring limits and constraint back into the conversation. We also have to activate a conversation about like design asks the question, what can you do? In general, capitalism asks the question, what can you do? And ethics asks the question, what should you do? Hmm. And if you're not doing both of those things, you're just like, I th it's kind of like what Tim Waltz did when he said, well, that's just weird. <laughs> like, I kind of think we have to hold that stance of like, oh yeah, that's so yesterday when we didn't ask those questions. Like that's so just, that's dumb. Like what, what is smart is to hold these questions together so that we can work with constraints to create things that are more abundant, biodiverse, beautiful, collaborative. And I think, I think that's a way that we can influence those kinds of conversations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for bringing like, uh, you know, a much needed depth to this conversation that, uh, that, that is difficult to navigate at times because it is so big and there are so many moving pieces. And I do want to say, you know, for folks that might be interested in researching this further, uh, one way that I've also found some, some way to make sanity uh, on this path and continue to learn and learn from folks, folks like you've mentioned, Samantha, but also I think just uh, there's a large movement around eco villages uh, and intentional communities, you know, groups of people trying to figure out, okay, what, what really matters, what brings true lasting fulfillment and joy that is in harmony with nature, that leverages the technology that we have developed, but uses it in a way for human and natural flourishing, uh, really points to, I feel like, this sense of the true human that's trying to mm -hmm. find its balance and relationship with nature and harmony. Um, so that's something folks can, can explore as well. Mm. Well, I think with that, it's a great time to, to bring it in for a landing. Uh, Samantha, is there anything you want to leave us with? Any kind of thought or audacious vision um, that we can start to, to work towards before we, before we sign off? A thing I've been holding lately. I mean, certainly if you're paying attention to what's going on, it can get pretty intense. And a thing that I think is very helpful to hold is that, um, so I've had my own visions over many years that we're collaborating with a higher evolutionary potential for ourselves, for each of us as individuals and for humanity as a whole and for this planet as a whole. Uh, and then just recently, I was really blessed to um, hear a little bit of what is inside the Kala Chakra teachings. The Kala Chakra teachings are the prophetic teachings of Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhism. The prophetic teachings, there's also a whole initiation. But a piece of the, uh, the, the whole framing of the Kala Chakra is that as the, and this aligns with other prophetic narratives, that as things get more and more intense, that um, the, the wheel of time, of, of time as we've been living it, which is uh, control time, Gregorian time is off, it's outside, it's un, unhinged from the way natural living systems work. So as, as the wheel of degradation intensifies, it's spinning another wheel that's going in the opposite direction, like a clock. And that other wheel is the wheel of return to spiritual and natural time and return to harmony. And I've been actually holding that. I want to offer it to the two of you and to the listeners, because the more I hold that in my felt sense, it's like when I'm freaking out or having an emotional response, I can say, okay, and where are we going? Where, what am I orienting towards? I'm orienting towards the boot up of the reciprocal cycles. And I don't always know how to do that. I still live in this system. I still drive a car. I still do like, I'm certainly not doing it perfectly in any way, shape or form. Not that you could, but I am definitely orienting my love, my energy, my attention, my creative force towards that, the other wheel activating. And I think just having an awareness 
that there's another wheel <laughs> and that that wheel is the wheel of, uh, you know, in the African lineage, it's the wheel of the golden age, like being booted up. And so, and then I know, I, I think that the way we participate with that in, in any moment is how we interact with what's whatever's in front of us, whether it's a store clerk or the mother who's having a hard time with her kid and then you turn to the kid and you like start giggling with the kid and the whole energy shifts or we have so many opportunities to show up as a reciprocal loving present force or not and so i think that's the way that we can collaborate with that yeah beautifully beautifully said i actually have a a tattoo on my leg that I'm working on right now that represents human time and divine time and then working all together. So pretty cool. We're on the same, same wavelength there. It's funny, interesting how those things work out. Yeah, we, we can do that. Yeah. That very cool. Waves out there. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Well, Samantha, th- thank you so much for, for your time, for your presence, for your energy, your willingness to share your, your visions and also ways that we can make practical changes in our life. This has been great for us. I'm sure our listeners too. Um, yeah. And, and if you're listening, if this has impacted you, if you feel like this message is, is helpful, share it. Um, this is how we create these conversations and how we, how we grow these conversations to actually start to have more impact and more ripples than we will, than any of us will, will ever know. So if you found this valuable, please share. And, uh, we will put all Samantha's uh, contact info in the episode so you can reach out with her and, and connect with her. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's such a, just a delight really grateful for our time thank you conscious conversations with nick and nitin 